All right, welcome everyone to the Wars of Religion lecture. Uh, so there's four Wars of Religion. We're going to talk about three in this chapter and then one in chapter 15. So your first one we've already talked about, which is your Schmuck Wars. And your Schmuck Wars, just to review, is your Protestant princes, whoops, sorry, your Protestant princes, uh, they got together within the Holy Roman Empire uh, to try and defeat Charles and his Catholic army. They weren't doing so well until they formed an alliance with the French king, Henry II, and then they were able to defeat Charles and force Charles to issue that Peace of Augsburg in 1555, which was the legalize, officially split the church and legalize Lutheranism. So that was the Schmuck Wars, first religious war. Your second religious war was the very little known revolt in the Netherlands. So yesterday, well that will be today, uh, we talked about Philip II, and Philip II was the leader of Spain. Philip ruled, if you look at the map, Philip ruled uh, the Low Countries, which as we know are kind of up here in Netherlands area. He also ruled Spain, uh, the southern part of Italy down here where the Papal States are, and the New World because Columbus has already sailed the ocean blue. The Netherlands uh, is divided half Protestant, half Catholic, although if you can look at the map, all the stripes and the different colors, you even got some Anabaptists going on here uh, in this part the, that we refer to as the Low Countries. All right, so the Netherlands is technically much like the Holy Roman Empire. It's 17 semi-independent provinces, uh, all under or loosely under the Spanish throne. So Philip rules over the Netherlands much like Charles rules over the Holy Roman Emperor. So there's independent princes that are in charge of many of the states, but all together they're under the Spanish throne. So they are wealthy. Uh, Antwerp, if you see, oh, Antwerp isn't on here. Well, Antwerp uh, is the main trading port of the north, so that Hanseatic League that we talked about in the last chapter uh, in the trading Certainly, uh, Amsterdam has the, the wealthiest trading center in Europe at the time. And because of the Peace of Augsburg that was issued in 1555, uh, the Lutherans and the Catholics are now legal in the Holy Roman Empire, which leaves the Calvinists especially and the Anabaptists to have to find a new home. And so they flooded into the Low Countries in the Netherlands, and Philip because he didn't really want anything to do with the, the Protestants and the new influx of Protestants, issues huge tax increases and an inquisition. And both the tax increase and this inquisition, you know, like the Spanish inquisition, but now he's looking for people who are non-Catholic, uh, he, people revolt. And so the 10,000 Spanish troops uh, will flood the Netherlands, and a guy named William of Orange uh, will provide pretty substantial Protestant leadership in the Netherlands, and so it's Charles and his army of 10,000, or Charles, Philip, his army of 10,000, versus William of Orange and the Protestants, and ultimately it leads to peace in 1579, and you have in the north, and as you see um, up here, these provinces, uh, there's seven Protestant provinces, and it's settled with the Peace of Utrecht. And in 1779, there is the southern provinces uh, signed the Union of Arras, A-R-R-A-S, uh, to accept the Spanish throne. So ultimately, the revolt in the Netherlands, lots of people die. Philip goes to defend Catholicism after the Protestants' revolt, and in the end, they divide it in half. Seven provinces go Catholic, seven provinces go Calvinist. All right, there it is. Philip and the Catholics versus the Protestants led by William of Orange. And the result, independent provinces in the north for the Protestants and in the southern provinces, they're Catholic under Philip II. I didn't add the second there. It's not just any old Philip. It's Philip II, the defender of Catholicism. All right, the most important wars, probably religious wars, are the French wars of religion. So that's in your book when it talks about all the Henrys. Instead of having it be one big war, uh, like the Hundred Years' War, it's a series of 13 short wars. Uh, and so they call it the wars of religion. It's a three-sided struggle. So here's Here's the three. You've got Henry of Navarre, and Henry of Navarre is your French Calvinist. Remember, Huguenots a Calvinist. Ca Huguenots a French Calvinist. So he's the Protestant. Henry of Guise, he's your ultra-Catholic. So he's backed by the Jesuits, the papacy, crazy Catholic Philip II, 
All right, so Henry of Guise is the ultra-Catholic, and then you have the king, King Henry III. So he's the son of Henry II, the one that we talked about in the Schmuck Wars, right? And he's just a regular Catholic. He's part of the Valois family, which has been the ruling family since we talked about new monarchs. All right, so it's those three. Now what will happen is those three will want power, and they've been feuding. And the attempt at compromise happens when Henry III's sister, so the King of France, decides to marry Henry of Navarre. All right, it's supposed to be kind of a sign of reconciliation. These two are going to get married. And so Henry of Navarre, which is in, Navarre is in the south of France, and his family and entourage all come to Paris because they're going to have this huge marriage celebration. While the day before, this rumor starts that the Protestants are plotting to overthrow the king while they're there. Now, the rumor was started by the third guy, ultra-Catholic Henry of Guise, guys. All right, so there's going to be a marriage between the Protestant of Navarre and King Henry, King Henry's sister. And the other Henry of Guise starts a rumor um, that says they're really coming to slaughter and to take over King Henry III's job. So in the early morning of August 24th, the day of the wedding, Henry III, the King of France's mom, Catherine de' Medici, sends out a mob of Catholics to find Protestants and kill them. And this frenzied Catholic mob um, basically turns into bloodthirsty killers, um, and three days of violence will lead thousands of Protestant Huguenots dead in Paris. That will be referred to as the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. That is one of those terms and, and events that you do have to know. St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, murder of thousands of Huguenots by the King Henry's Catholics, all right, ordered by his mom, Catherine de' Medici, those crazy mothers. All right, so then you've got the ultra-Catholics now kind of seeking or seeing weakness, obviously four years later, uh, but they want to make Catholic, ultra-Catholic Henry the true king of France. So they form this thing called the Holy League. In 1588 to 1589, the biggest war is the War of Three Henrys. All right, so of all the series of 13 wars, this one is the turning point. Henry of Navarre ends up being victorious. But what happens is it's a series of assassinations. So Henry of Guise takes his Holy League and they go, to, they go seize Paris. All right. Henry III, who was in charge, he assassinates Henry of Guise and then joins with Navarre to defeat the rest of the Holy League. All right, so ultra-Catholic comes in, tries to take over King Henry III. Henry III has him assassinated, the ultra-Catholic, and then joins with Henry of Navarre. Their armies together drive out the Holy League. Now, King Henry III is also then assassinated by a crazy monk who was mad that he was cooperating with Henry of Navarre, the Protestant. So, ultra-Catholic is assassinated, a regular King Henry is assassinated, and there stands Henry of Navarre, the new King of France. And that's it. <laughs> it's just, just that easy. Uh, so he then, but he's a Protestant, and the majority of France is Catholic. And so he converts to Catholicism with the famous saying, surely Paris is worth a mass. Meaning, he'd rather be king and convert to Catholicism than he would not be king or, you know, be involved in this civil war. So what he does then is he becomes king, converts to Catholicism, and then 10 years later issues the Edict of Nantes. All right, even more important, probably the most important part of our 10 minute lecture here is the Edict of Nantes. All right, it recognizes Catholicism as the official religion, but most importantly, it says it's okay to be Huguenot. So we finally recognized Calvinism, not in the Holy Roman Empire, but we've recognized it in France. All right, so the War of Three Henrys, ultimately fighting between the Three Henrys, actually all the French wars of religion, fighting between the Three Henrys for the leadership, Navarre wins, converts to Catholicism, and then issues religious toleration for the Protestants with the Edict of Nantes. All right, so important pieces there as we talk about religious toleration and religious wars. It won't be our last religious war. Uh, we do have the Thirty Years' War, which we will talk about, that will happen in the Holy Roman Empire. Um, but for now, that is it. Um, St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, Edict of Nantes, key pieces of this lecture. Good luck on your test tomorrow.